Hey guys, I just wanted to reach out to you and let you know that Surewinder is still selling amazing products. Some of you guys have been dragging your feet for whatever reason. If your shoulder hurts, do not waste time. Pull the trigger. I just bought uh, four or five of them and uh, we had two guys out. You know how much it cost me to pay for two guys being out with bad shoulders? We just pulled the trigger and we said, listen, everybody's going to have one on a truck. It's mandatory. You got to use it. Don't hesitate. Don't wait till your guys go down. It's going to cost you more. Buy a Surewinder. It's not every day someone invents something that changes the game. I found out about this product that I'm talking to you about uh, and I had to try it. So I ordered a few and after using it, I'm sold. Now we stock them on our trucks. It's called All Brace and it will help you sell more service and buy you time until doors come in. There's never been a greater time for a product like this. Phil has a video on his website of him cutting a door literally in half, installing the All Brace and running it like nothing ever happened. It is literally incredible. One of the greatest selling videos I've ever seen. You're going to want to check it out at all-brace.com. What's up, guys? Ryan here, Torsion Talk Podcast. And today, we're going to have a little fun. We're going to drag you guys into my world, a little bit of the uh, the tech side. Uh, I've got Adam McBride, which none of you guys are going to know who he is. Maybe if you're on Twitter and you like NFTs, uh, he likes to to be very social there. Uh, but Adam and I are uh, part of a project called Amplify Art, and that's how we met. And uh, he is like, in my eyes, I view him as like an OG NFT guy who just seems to get it. And so if you have questions, even stupid ones, he's quick to be like, you're an idiot, or no, that actually could work. Uh, but he's got good advice, and I thought he'd be a good person to interview and share some thoughts and have conversations. NFT seemed to be like a really hot topic, even amongst garage door dealers that I'm talking to. So I wanted to bring him on and have this conversation and help educate you guys. I know it's not garage door related or, uh, or contractor related, but um, we're going to have fun with this and it's just going to be chill and laid back. So I hope you guys enjoy it because I definitely think NFTs are going to change the game in the construction world specifically. Uh, but in, in all aspects of our lives. So um, sit back and enjoy. Adam, how are you, sir? Man, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I couldn't agree, agree more. You know, I, I think when we talk about NFTs today, we talk about basically art, pictures of monkeys and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Profile pictures on Twitter. But the reality is, is what M NFTs are. And the reason I think it's really huge is that this is a game changer for uh, tech. It's a game changing technology that every human on earth is going to be using in a decade. So um, even though it's going to take that long right for now, every human, what's that? You think it'll take that long? Uh, yeah, I would say at least, at least 10 to, 10 to 15 years to be fully embedded in people's lives. Just the tech needs to, to catch up, right? Yeah. Um, right now you still have to get a wallet. Um, and though it's, it's easy to set up a wallet and stuff, still most people don't want to do those kind of steps. No. Um, and so like that, that sort of tech, around that needs to get easier in my view. Um, it's gonna help a lot with Coinbase. Coinbase is offering their own kind of wallet. That's the kind of thing we need. We need big companies to, to make it super easy, super easy to onboard. And when they launch in what, like a month or so yeah. uh, and bring their 70 million users on board, I think that's gonna be a big thing for the space. All right, so let's take a step back. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. Um, let's start with super simple because a lot of the people who follow our podcast are contractors. They're riding around a truck. They got tools, they got cash, and they're willing to learn. So let's teach. Let's teach a sure. little bit. What is an NFT? So at the simplest form, what an NFT is digital ownership. Um, I know people will say, well, it's a non-fungible token. What does that even mean? You know, frankly, what it means is that you can own something digitally and nobody controls it. It's on a public blockchain, meaning the blockchain keeps record of who owns what. So right now, your house is owned on a piece of paper at a municipality in a town in somewhere USA, right? We're all comfortable with that. But in the future, um, there's this second like rail of opportunity to own things in a digital space globally 
that is controlled by no one but a set of computers all around the world. And to some people that might be scary. To other people like myself, I see it as um, freedom as a bu- as as a buffer against um, bad actors. Uh, also, as a way to enable individuals to have better control over their lives. And so for me, it's it's incredibly exciting because I think it brings in a whole sl- whole sections of the the globe and the world into a market into a global marketplace uh, and onboards literally billions of people into a global marketplace. So for me, it's a, it's I've never been more excited about a space that I'm 50 years old and been in, doing my own businesses. Dang, you're 50, bro. <laughs> Dude, you age well, bro. <laughs> And you got so much energy for 50, man. I need to know what you're, are you on the ginseng? I'm on the coffee, man. <laughs> Bucket of coffee a day, brother. <laughs> you're hustling all day, bro. I, I get all the notifications. I'm, I'm like, dang, dude, this dude don't stop, man. Dude, when you love, you know the way it is, man. When you love what you do, awesome. I, I love it, man. And I've never, I mean, look, I've had my own business. I work, I, I have no problem working 15 hours a day forever when I'm psyched about what I do. Uh, when I when I tr- like truly jumped into NFTs, really about a year ago, right now, uh, went full time, bro. I was in 15 hours. I've been doing 50 hours a day. I have not taken a day off in a year because um, this is so exciting to me. It's just and you're branding happening. yourself at the same time. Like it's fun and you're branding yourself. True. Yeah, I've been I've been branding myself. This has kind of been for me. I've been very very fortunate, very blessed to be on a, a wave that's that's a, a great wave. And you guys who, who have businesses know what I'm talking about, right? To, to hit the right business at the right time uh, is nothing but luck and a blessing, right? And this yeah. is, so this has been just a, an amazing year for me. All right, so we talked about NFTs. What's a wallet? Okay, so a wallet is a way to hold your digital asset. Um, now remember, this is a public blockchain. Mean everybody, meaning everybody can see everything at all times. I know what you have in your wallet, and you know what I have in my wallet, right? And if I have an NFT in my wallet, say a picture of a board ape, and I own that board ape, and I transfer it to you, everybody on Earth can see that you are now the owner of that board ape. The wallet is simply the keys to my little safe on the blockchain, if you will, like a vault. And, like it's like a vault. But the thing is that people need to know is that when you you can buy like what are called hardware wallets that basically look like a little thumb drive, right? And people will say, oh, I put my NFT on my hardware wallet. They think it's like dragging a PDF file or a Google Doc or a, you know, a Word document onto that thumb drive. That's not actually what it is. All that thumb drive does is store your password, your super secret key to your blockchain wallet. Right. So you can actually take that wallet and throw it in the the ocean or burn it or whatever. It doesn't even matter. As long as you remember the initial seed phrase for that wallet, you can still access your blockchain wallet. Right. So all that is is storing your your keys to or that access point um, to the blockchain. But um, so it's a little confusing for people. What would you say are the three most popular wallets that Um, would be easy for people to get on? So first thing you're going to need to do is get, if you're doing anything with crypto at all, get yourself a hardware wallet. Um, I just recommend Ledger because the vast majority of people I know use Ledger as their hardware wallet. You can also get a Trezor, but really most people use Ledger. Uh, They're like 60 bucks. I recommend getting at least two. One is your main one and one is a backup because if something goes wrong or you lose it or it breaks, it's good to have that backup so you can reinitiate. Um, what I've just described, get this, you know, your seed phrase back into the new wallet and have access to your NFTs um, and, you know, and, and ETH or Bitcoin or whatever you have on the blockchain, right? Um, then you're going to need another wallet to actually interface with websites and be able to buy NFTs, buy and sell NFTs. Uh, and for that, most people use MetaMask. There's a plugin right for your Chrome browser. Um, so basically you get MetaMask on your Chrome, uh, and then you basically just plug in this like USB stick. It looks like called a ledger and that allows you to buy and sell NFTs. It's actually pretty easy, but like in, until you know, you don't know, right? It can be confusing for, for beginners. I've actually created like a, an ex, a Google doc 
that I can share with my friends and family and stuff. Cause yeah. they're like, well, what do I do? And I've created you like a five step so many process. times. I'm just going to document bro, it, and shoot it over to you. Bro. Ex that's exactly that's what I did. Like so little videos, how to set it up and stuff like that. Because can you um, share that yeah. with me so I can maybe put a link to it in the, absolutely. Absolutely. I I've onboarded, you know, dozens of people, but I do know that for a lot of people, um, even that is too much. And that's why, um, I'm super psyched about, you know, Coinbase coming on board and basically having their own proprietary wallet that basically gives you the same trust mechanism, but it's all through your email, it's through Coinbase, very safe. And, you know, that's the way I would recommend for most people to interface with NFTs. All right. So just to recap and kind of condense what he said. So he's recommending you get two what's called hard wallets, um, ledgers and, um, and one is a backup and then one is a main and the seed phrases for everything you're going to do on the blockchain is going to be what you absolutely need to make sure you have we're going to talk yeah. a little bit about like maybe what's the best place to store those or like how to keep up with it but um mm -hmm. then he those are offline you can bring them online right um but they're primarily offline and the, and the reason why that is such a good thing is because no, like even if somebody were to get a hold of like a password or something, if something's offline, they can't access it. Right. So, right. um, so it's completely removed from being online and then it's, it's unhackable. Uh, if you put it online, then it could be potentially hackable. That's now, exactly right. I mean, to, to put it kind of simply like MetaMask, you can do it all just through MetaMask. Right? Correct. The issue becomes that your computer could get hacked at any time. Right. And so somebody could take control of that MetaMask and then steal your stuff. If I have it on my hardware wallet interfacing through MetaMask, MetaMask always has to ask permission to the hardware wallet. And you literally, it's got a little screen on it and you got to like approve the transaction on that little piece of tech. You could have a completely hacked computer and nobody could steal your stuff because of that hardware wallet. So that's why I always recommend it. The MetaMask is pretty good. I mean, it's encrypted. Oh, it's, it's like, you know, uh, I think where most people get hacked on MetaMask is uh, phishing emails. Um, you know, people will send, this is anything, but people will send an email to you saying, you know, hey, like I get these MetaMask phishing emails where it's like, uh, you know, this app was just connected to your MetaMask wallet. Click here if it wasn't you. Right? <laughs> So yeah, bro. Click there and enter in your login and password so that they can get your login and password. And then they use that to log into your MetaMask account and yep, clear yep. you out. So, and that's anything that's bank. That's account. anything. I mean, dude, it's the Amazon. same thing. I've told my wife, look, if you ever get an email from Amazon, right? Just always, always send that to the garbage. Like they may, it may be legitimate, but what you then do is you just go to Amazon and you log on. You just don't click that link in that email, right? I mean, that's yeah. that's, that's literally for every regardless. every business in the world. Like you'd never yeah. click on a link in an email ever. And that's it. And while we're on the topic, and a lot of the people listening to the show are business owners, that's a like if you're not telling your staff not to click on phishing emails and how to recognize phishing emails, that's important too because people can infiltrate your business um, and shut you down as well. So you want to be super careful of that. All right. So we talked about NFTs. We talked about wallets. You brought up this technology called blockchain. Um, I don't really think we need to get too much into that, but just reference and put it all together. Uh, blockchain is the technology. A lot of this crypto stuff's built on top of, and it's a ledger, um, a public ledger where all the transactions are recorded. And now I know Adam said that everything is transparent. Now it is, however, it's also not. So, um, you are recognized by not by name, but by an address key made up of a bunch of different characters. So they may not know that it's Ryan Lucia that got this transfer of, you know, an NFT or a Bitcoin, but they know that wallet address did. And so uh, there's ways and people have gotten really savvy of trying to like figure out what wallets are with who and stuff like that. So if you do leave a paper trail out in public or you post your wallet address, then a lot of times people can make that connection. So um, that's why, like, I think, you know, uh, the, the technology was created uh, by a secret person that really we don't know. Right. I mean, yeah, 
people say they know, or there's people that even claim they are him, but uh, <laughs> I'm Satoshi, loser. man. What are you talking about? <laughs> I told you that, man. So, uh, yeah, I yeah, think it was the, the Bitcoin conference down in Miami. I'm not sure it was the NFT dude. Uh, I met the NFT guy that almost got in a fight with him. Did you see that video? <laughs> I have seen that video. You know, it's funny. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's the odds. I've spoken to enough people. People think it's almost it. Shitoshi was most likely a a grouping of like two or three people. Right. Um, But I guess it doesn't really matter. Actually, what kind of matters and what is kind of nice is that nobody actually does know who he is. So there's nobody to like go after. Um, And that's kind of nice because the whole one of the whole things about this blockchain deal is that you know, I mean, we're in a world now where these governments are kind of overreaching. If you look at kind of anything that's going on in Canada and, right now, where they're shutting down freaking bank accounts and taking money for protests, bro, it's it's crazy. I mean, look, you can disagree. I disagree with, you know, 90 percent of the stuff out there. But if you have a GoFundMe account and and they literally confiscate 10 million dollars from a peaceful protest GoFundMe account, Lord help us. Right. Yeah. And um, blockchain is a last stand against tyranny, in in, in my view. I, I hope it never comes to that. Uh, certainly in the West, but certainly for people in China, it that way fast though, dude. Dude, and but look for for I know for sure, and there's obviously it's well known that some of these like countries with dictators, China and the rest, blockchain has been um, for a lot of people. It's basically the only way they can get money away from you know, communist regimes and stuff. So yeah. in, in that way, it is, uh, it's really important for free people everywhere to support blockchain, in my opinion. And, and I believe that uh, Satoshi, th- that this was indeed exactly what the intention was to give the power back to the people, right. To, uh, to, to bring distance between overreaching governments and banks um, because with blockchain and Bitcoin, which is built on blockchain, uh, it, it, I wouldn't say Bitcoin's like a replacement for money because I don't believe that it's like a great solution for, for money, but I do believe the technology can be developed in a way that it can be. And you have things like stable coins and stuff like that, that can be used for commerce and trading and whatever. Yeah. Um, but, uh, the timing of the, the invention and the evolution of everything couldn't have been more better, right? I mean, because it took some time for adoption. You had the government talk about shutting it down. It was originally like, I remember hearing about it back in like 2013 and everybody was like associating it with the dark web. And if you, you know, buy Bitcoin or earn Bitcoin, you're going to go to prison. And (laughs) it was like a lot of freaking FUD and, and negativity around it. So some of that separated, right? When you got the dark web, the guy got, got caught and went to prison or whatever. And then, you know, now you have this Bitcoin thing that's, and then it p- starts pumping and going crazy and people start recognizing it and then it drops and everybody gets mad. And then, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> kind of funny. Um, I mean, look, I, I, the way I try to tell it to my, some people who still, they still don't really understand what Bitcoin symbolizes. And to be clear, it, the, the end result may not be Bitcoin. It may not be Ethereum. It may be some other blockchain that humanity at some point adopts. But the reality is, is for the entire history of humanity, however many thousands of years you want to go back, right? At first we use whatever shells we, we use Box something shells. as a medium of exchange. Right. And at the end of the day, we got to the dollar. Right. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that it is always the reason why shells doesn't work is because you could always go to the beach and pick up more shells or somebody could go and make another big giant stone. Right. And what we see with the U S dollar and literally every currency in the history of man is the people who print the currency or make it make more and use that for themselves in their own ill-gotten gains it It happens massive inflationary problems it it happens everywhere there is no stop that's the way that's the nature of humanity and the nature of currency can't even stop ourselves this is the first time ever in the history of humanity where we can do it differently and that's powerful it is and the reason why he's saying that you guys is because uh there's only 21 million bitcoin that can ever be uh what we call mined uh, essentially just call it created. Um, 
once that 21 million is up, uh, that's it. And that means that it they have all each Bitcoin has an owner unless it's lost. And there's quite a few million that are lost that we can never ever get again. Um, mm -hmm. But you have you have Bitcoin that can like they can't print more, they can't make more, they can't nothing. And so it's it's almost deflationary. Like it's it's going to uh, it's almost impossible for it not to go up in price gradually over time now you'll have the big dips and the fluctuation because you got tons of manipulation by people with lots of money sure. using this to capitalize on the times because they know that it, you know once bitcoin gets to a quarter million or half million or even a million dollars per bitcoin it's not going to be as easy to, to to you know it'll probably stable out a little bit and you may be you may be working a job making you know uh one one hundredth of a bitcoin a year you yeah, know what yeah. I'm saying? Like and Definitely. carrying a little card where you swipe it and pay. And it's, you were talking like miniature fractions uh, when you go to the store to buy bread or whatever. Yeah. So that's kind of the way I view it. Um, I mean, all I you got to do really is look at some of these countries that are in hyper uh, inflationary times like Nigeria. I mean, maybe not even hyperinflation, just in super inflation mm -hmm. and the it use is. of their by their population of Bitcoin is is like massive they have like 40 percent adoption of bitcoin right cool. like anybody with a phone is getting themselves bitcoin right and and if this if bitcoin had happened in 2000 trust me everybody in venezuela would have had bitcoin i mean everyone right um and don't think right there is no case in recorded human history where currency didn't inflate to the point of basically being worthless it always happens um so maybe the u.s takes another hundred years and maybe it's tomorrow right i mean i'm just i don't want to be like total yeah. gloom and doom but the the we do it to ourselves but just you know have a little piece there for yourself man Absolutely. yeah and, and i'll say one more thing and, and then we'll move on get back on the topic of nfts but i think it's a good topic because I'm, i want people to feel comfortable around the technology and understanding uh how this works but um you know uh you have countries adopting this now as a currency and whether I agree or disagree with the use case, um, I still think that's really powerful and it shows um, that there are some innovators out there because here's the thing, if you're a leader and you're willing to put Bitcoin as your, as your, like a, a true currency where you can get paid, you can pay taxes, you can pay for goods and services. Um, Th then then that's a big deal because you're basically essentially saying, okay, well, our money can now be decentralized uh, to a degree. And so uh, that's, that's a, that's a good thing, right? Like I'm just a true believer in decentralization, cutting out the middlemen. Um, middlemen have been taking advantage of the little men for way too long. Right. And, and getting rich off of us. So um, right now I just read an article, I think it was yesterday or watched a video um, or actually it was a, uh, if you guys listen to Joe Rogan, his podcast, he had a guest on that was talking about a uh, central banking system coming out with a programmable digital currency. Did Whoa, you see that? Be careful, bro. It is so, I mean, if you see that it is in human nature to run to a tyrannical government and you hear about a, a digital currency that the government's going to issue, we need to fight against this all hands on deck. Because this is, I mean, dude, all you got to do is look at China. Like, all yeah. you got to do is look what they're doing. They're like, number one, they're going to, they're rolling this thing out over there. Why? They can literally control every person in that country. They can try. They don't like what you're pull doing. A report and see what you spend your money on. They can, they can make, they can take your money away. They can give you money if you're doing the right thing and you're being a good boy. And they can take it away if you're being a bad boy. It's terrifying. Yep. terrifying yeah. don't so i mean it, this guy was saying in the video apparently the video got taken off of uh youtube so i had to watch it on some like new sketch uh uncensored like whatever but uh and and apparently it got taken off of spotify too if i'm not mistaken but they were saying that the central banking system is coming out with a programmable uh digital currency that will um will put employers and government in charge of how you spend your money 
So first of all, I just want to say, look, I'm a business owner. I own multiple businesses. I do not, absolutely, 100% do not want the responsibility of trying to choose where <laughs> my employees spend their money. Not an option. Don't care for it. Like, you know, we're a free country. We should never even be thinking this way. It's kind of blowing my mind that we are. Um, but definitely also don't want the government, uh, you know, trying to tell us, you know, hey, we, we we're, we're not for the government. So you can only buy, you know, you know, this kind of bread and this kind of soup and this kind of water, and you can't get anything else. They lock you I down. Mean, bro, we've, we've seen it to a small degree where um, like cities like New York City will put a heavy tax on Coca-Cola or soda, right? Um, we see it, but this is all they could do in the past it was like try to enact a law, raise a tax, right? Do that sort of thing. But it was localized and it was small. Now imagine, you know, whoever the, the person in power is, you know, and saying, oh, well, you can't have uh, uh, a Ram truck because or you can have a Ram truck and we're going to charge you more for every time or you to every time you take it out or every time you fill up or, you know, just then they could lay these things on you at any time. And yep. for all my liberal friends out there, don't think. It can't be used against you too. Like just because your guy's in power right now, you know, what do you think this sort of power in the opposite hands could do? And, you know, open your brain to that. It's terrifying on both accounts for anybody who wants to be a free person in, in this world. It is completely terrifying. Yeah. All right. So now that we've scared everybody, to now that, we've scared you totally <laughs> in all honesty, I think that it's worth your time to research um, because money, uh, whoever has the most money is in power and uh, you need freedom. And so there's decentralized cryptocurrencies out there that are totally under attack too. Um, but just educate yourself. And if you have questions, you can reach out to me. I'll try to help you out. Um, but let's get back on NFT. So you had mentioned like apes and stuff like that. I want to get a little bit more granular into like, we talked about what is an NFT, but like, what are the different forms of NFT? And before you get into this, I just want to say, like, let's talk about, uh, before we get into that, let's talk about a smart contract, okay? Because in my eyes, I view an NFT as the front end of a smart contract. So can you give us a, like, a really easy breakdown of what a smart contract is? Sure. Basically, it's, it's this. It's if I do something and you've written a smart contract, when I do something, that meets that smart contracts rules, something happens back. So in the most basic, a smart contract is I want to sell you my board ape and I put a price on it. If you put in that amount of ether or payment, I put in the board ape, you get the board ape and I get the payment. Like at the basic level, that's a smart contract at the basic, basic level is it's a transaction. Uh, and trustless transaction. So the rules are written in the small co smart contract. And as long as we abide by those rules, the outcomes are guaranteed and take no, th it doesn't take a third party to do that transaction. So right now, the simplest way you think about it, you go buy a Coke at a gas station, right? You pay the guy and he gives it to you, but you paid with your credit card that has to go through a payment processor. It's got to go through visa. It's got to go through his bank and then he gets paid right on the blockchain and through smart contracts. I pay you in ETH and I get what you were selling. Right. And so these transactions happen trustlessly. Basically the computers dictate who gets what. And so it, it's a, a based on smart contract. contract. Yeah. That's what smart contracts based are. It, contract. it, it's basically the rules of the contract that anybody can look at. And you, so you know, what's going to happen automatically based on the actions you take. And I gave you the simplest one, which is just back and forth trading, but this gets into all sorts of really heavy uh, giant smart contracts that have to do with like banking and trading and lending and all this sort of stuff, uh, what they call decentralized finance or DeFi, where basically you're trying to replace the entire banking system. We won't get into that, but at, at the base, that's what is possible uh, through smart contracts that are laid on top of cryptocurrency consistency in everything including price 
reliability, quality, not just quality, but great quality control. These are things that describe Somer USA. Somer is not some startup company, not one that you need to be worried about going out of business in the near future. Somer's a two, Somer and their family of businesses are $200 million companies. They're in over 100 countries, and they have locations in 20 countries. This is a large organization who stands behind their product and works through integrity. And there's not another company out there willing to drop what they're doing and help you out like Somer. These guys are awesome. Not only have they been loyal to the Torsion Talk podcast, they've been loyal to the technicians and the owners of the companies who install their product. In my opinion, if you're not at least offering Somer as an additional option, you're cheating yourself. Listen, first time dealers, I've got a special for you. If you buy 10 or more Somers between now and the end of the season six, while supplies last, we will offer you free shipping. You have no more excuses. The prices are great. The product is amazing. Go check out Somer USA and order 10 for free shipping. I'm going to tell you guys a marketing secret. You want to gain more social media likes, shares, and follows? People love unique and cool projects. There are no better photos to share than the ones on Schweiss Doors social accounts. These guys post some incredible things. Make sure to go there and like and share their Facebook and Instagram post with your business account. So if you like their business account, you can share their uh, their post. The bifold doors are awesome. And they're doing some great projects that will go viral on social media if you share them. Go right now to Schweiss Door on Facebook and check out some of the projects they share and like their page. Oh, and don't forget, no one builds a better bifold than Schweiss. And so I want to give an example, and this is something that I would love to do myself, but I don't have time or energy. But um, do, give you an example of how this would affect you in today's world if it was already implemented let's say you had a big new construction commercial job and the whole job was one hundred fifty thousand dollars. um they say i don't want to give you a deposit and you're like well dude i don't want to i don't want to be your bank either so um they don't trust you because they don't want you to run off with the money and not order the product and you don't trust them because you don't want to get screwed and not get paid for the product so uh, what you can do is you can write up a smart contract where it doesn't even really need an attorney Right. Um, you draw up the rules of the contract. They, uh, you can even pull the bank in, uh, that's funding the project and have three people involved and say, okay, uh, I'm okay with this. If in this smart contract, the 50%, uh, goes into an escrow account and then we pull in the manufacturer for the doors. Um, and then we say, all right, uh, at the point of shipping, the funds for the doors are going to be transferred to the door company. Mm-hmm. Then once we install the door, once they arrive and uh, we're ready to schedule, you're going to release another 20% to us uh, to cover some of our expenses. And then after it's done, after the job's completed, uh, you release the remaining 50% uh, and, and, or you know whatever the percentages are. And then right. so uh, that way, it's super clean and easy. And uh, the smart contract, all the money has to go into like a kind of like an escrow account. Uh, is the best way to describe it. That's exactly right. I mean, that's, that's what, um, that's what is possible. Um, right now, kind of the tools for the layman are still being built to do stuff like that. Right. Uh, basically the first things that are happening right now are, are the lending part of that, that you're talking about. Like that's actually possible right now. Like you can do bot lend like me personally, I can lend out my cryptocurrency to other people who want to borrow it. Right. And, and those sort of transactions are all happening already uh, through DeFi. Um, so yeah, all that kind of stuff is, is completely possible. And this is like when I tell people about the future of crypto and, and NFTs and stuff, this is what we're talking about. Yep. All right. And, and, and to his point too, is like a business, instead of being like completely subject to the bank and them approving you for a loan and whatnot, um, you can just remove the banks altogether because I think in 
like he said, 10, 15 years, probably the, the banks are going to either look very different or they're not going to be around. Yeah, uh, dude. I mean, imagine, imagine this, right? You're, you're, and this is a little far afield, but imagine, um, your home, uh, that, 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 you know, deed to your house isn't, is no longer stored in a municipality, but it's stored on the blockchain. I could just put that deed up into the smart contract and get all the loans that I need it. And, and people would be able to give you groupings of people, not just a person, yeah. but groupings of people all over the world would be able to loan me money based on my house, right? It opens up the world to a global, uh, a global banking system where the banks are the individuals. Yeah. Um, I can loan money. This, this, research yeah. cellulose. Um, it's cellulose, right? Yeah, uh, Celsius. Yeah, Celsius. Sorry, I met yeah. the uh, I met the founder or one of the top guys at Celsius um, at one of the conferences. Super smart, and I know he's been under fire uh, a couple of times. Uh, but when you're doing innovative things, there's going to be some bad press around it. Um, but uh, he seems like he's legit. But uh, that's that's a blockchain company doing DeFi. Um, so you guys can research that company and kind of wrap your head around it. So we don't spend too much time on it today. Um, now I want to talk about, you keep mentioning bored apes. What the <laughs> heck, man? Like, we're all like, dude, what is a bored ape? Like the only uh, reason I mention them is because you see incredible, incredible wealth generated in a year. Right. I mean, these are just their images on the blockchain, right? It's 10,000 unique apes. Right. And, and there were one of the thousand projects that got released last year. But for whatever reason, uh, they hit right with people and people really wanted them. And they went on a rocket ship where you could get in. I mean, I know a lot of people. I know probably 40, 50 people who bought like personally know them who bought them at, you know, point oh five ETH or whatever it was at the launch. Right. So I don't even know what that is, um, you know. 800 on, bucks, bucks, 500 bucks. I don't even know. Um, and th these things trade for, I, I know, I personally know people who sold ones for $2.5 million, right? Um, the returns are so outrageously once in a lifetime. I mean, it's literally lottery tickets, but I know dozens of people who've, who've won these lottery tickets over the last year. So it's, it's really been incredible. But at the, at the end of the day, like I said, this is just the beginning of, of kind of NFTs. And so it is, in my view, can be very froth, frothy and very bubbly. Um, so I'm not saying jump out there and buy a bored ape. Yeah. But uh, people are, are seeing these things as um, opportunities to be in on the ground floor of something special, possibly. So when you say, um, all right, I want to talk a little bit about the different most popular forms of nfts um you have uh jpegs photos right um you've got some gifs or gifs however mm -hmm. you want to pronounce that uh you have music which is um it's a project that you and i have worked on together mm -hmm. uh, with amplify art and uh that hasn't really hit big yet uh but i do believe it's a kind of the next big thing You've got uh, Gary V. He's talking about it constantly. Music mm -hmm. NFTs being the future of um, of artists being able to finally get their worth um, instead of being screwed and um, you know majority of their work going to a record label or um, you know iTunes and things like that. So uh, you got music NFTs. What what other? Uh, but you pretty much covered. I mean, there, so for example, um, I guess you would also maybe classify right now. Uh, popular NFTs would be art, like high-end art. So you do have quite a few um, very well-regarded artists who issue NFTs for their art, right? I mean, to give a little people a little bit of history, I'm I'm what they call on Twitter an NFT archaeologist. So I've gone back, spent the last year going back and trying to find old NFT projects uh, and help bring them to the modern uh, consumer and and re You've relaunch. Been pretty successful with that too, right? very successful it's been fantastic and but what i've learned going back is that most of the infrastructure for nfts was built by artists um, artists really early in bitcoin realized that 
the blockchain was a fantastic way of proving provenance for their art. And Bitcoin, when it was first launched, didn't have the functionality that made that possible. And so they worked for literally years trying to build this on Bitcoin and, and finally did. But there were all these fits and starts on different blockchains, blockchains like called Namecoin and uh, Dogecoin. And they finally did it on Bitcoin. But really, with the launch of Ethereum, Ethereum had the smart contract functionality that really, really allowed for artists to quite easily put their art on the blockchain. And what it does for them is it provides provenance. So we all know, you know, whatever, a Basquiat painting, right? Who controls the po provenance or, or the ownership of that painting is usually done by collect collectors combined with art houses, combined with museums, which say, okay, this Basquiat changed to this person's hands, who was sold to this person, who sold it to this museum to provide that tracking of provenance, right? Um, very labor intensive, very expensive. And for most artists, it, it doesn't work. Um, blockchain literally solves that issue for art. And so, so they really did, artists were the first ones, the first movers to really push NFTs and try to bring NFTs around and, and they have. And so now they're kind of reaping the rewards of this, which there are a lot of artists, I know dozens over the last year, who've really exploded because it's just finally, um, it allows them to reach a global audience who can now uh, verifiably know that they have a, a one of one piece from X copy or a one of one piece from uh, Jeffrey Allen Scudder or what, you know, from these very famous artists uh, and they can feel confident and know that they own it. And so that's, that's really special. And I now, love this. yeah, sorry, go ahead. Let me just interject real quick. I love this about the artist because you know, when my daughter was young, she's very artistic. And we, my wife used to make jokes about maybe she's going to be an artist one day. And I'm like, Hey, no, um, the art, being an artist does not pay. Um, that's, right. so that's a negative. Um, she's like, Oh, we could send her to SCAD and, you know, get her the best education. I'm like, babe, it doesn't pay. We'll never get our money back. <laughs> now I'm like, babe, you should go to SCAD and learn how to like draw and do design and then become like an NFT artist. So yeah. anyway, it's a crazy, yeah, no, dude, it, it's, it's literally, it's transformative because for, and I know I've, I've spoken with them on my podcast, right? Uh, these artists for literally decades were doing what we used to call digital art, right? And they do huge installations to try and be able to sell something to a collector. Cause how do you sell? digital art how do you create any sort of scarcity with something that's digital and nfts so actually right solve that copy issue. or say yeah. see what nfts do and, and so imagine most of your listeners probably remember uh napster right and mm -hmm. your ability to get free music right fantastic it's fantastic for the listener what what nfts enable is that same exact thing let's just take an artist i don't know kanye west it's the most everybody knows who he is right Kanye West can release a song, right? Everybody can listen to it, right? But if you want to collect his NFT and have a direct relationship with him, it's going to cost you 200 bucks or 500 bucks for that NFT to own his unique NFT. And NFTs enable that ownership, that provenance, and that, that really it's supportive environment for a lot of artists where they can get a collector and there's a bridge that's built through that NFT between the, the collector and the artist. That's really, really special. And I've seen that over the last year. And I think it's one of the things that kind of gets glossed over in the whole NFT thing, as a lot of you just, artists are just kind of using it as a money grab. But I think we'll see an evolution over the next decade or so of artists really using it as, as a way to connect with their fans in, in really unique and special ways. And we're already seeing it. That's we're already, already seeing, yeah, you're already the NFT that. acts as like a ticket um to an event it, it becomes a ticket to a concert it becomes a backstage pass depending on what nft you have all these sort of things are just starting with in like the music industry especially um and so th that it just has a lot of use cases uh for for both music and um and art yeah all right so uh we've got jpegs we've got music we've got uh, videos uh we've got still photos um one thing you didn't mention was DAOs, right? Um, yep. And the way NFT, I, most people probably don't know what a DAO is. Basically, it's a corporation or a company that's controlled by individuals. 
and but is set up on the blockchain. So in the same way that you would create a, you know, go down to, I don't know where you would go and I'm, I'm out, I'm in Costa Rica, so I don't know where you go, but I go to like the municipality to set up a corporation here, right? I have to like name shareholders, who owns what, it's a big old hassle, costs a ton of money, and then to keep track of it and who owns what and gets paid out and stuff, it's a total nightmare, right? Um, and God help you if you wanna go public and actually like raise funds through a IPO or something, like you better have a few million bucks sitting in your pocket to pay for it, right? Um, what DAOs do is basically enable all of that and you could set it up for basically free and you can sell NFTs or whatever to um, basically sell ownership of the DAO and to raise all sorts of money to, for whatever purpose you want. Or maybe it's for a business, maybe it's for to buy a piece of art. We saw recently um, the Constitution DAO I think they, re I put money into that. They raised $42 million in an, basically in a day to try and buy one of the 13 um, publicly available versions of the constitution. Um, you know, these things are coming, right? Because it, it, it allows a global audience to buy in and support things they care about. It's, uh, and have partial and it's completely in a completely decentralized way in a, in a way that everybody can see what's going on and can't be taken down by nefarious actors i guess you'd say yeah all right so we've got nfts we've got DAOs, which are actually creating movements and also super helpful of like taking out middlemen um you know i view DAOs as being a great opportunity for the american people to have more faith in our voting system uh, because i think that's kind of what it's built for right mm -hmm. and i'm not sure that DAOs are ready for a u.s election but I think it's headed in that direction and eventually we'll all own some type of certificate that validates that we're a U.S. citizen and we can vote. And then what ends up happening is you're tied maybe to your phone. And then on election day, instead of standing in line and going through that whole process, you open up an app on your phone and through that is connected to a DAO and you yeah. vote for all the people in the election. And you do that from the comfort of your own home. And it's probably one of the best ways to eliminate um, bad actors. Bad right? actors, yeah. We're on the topic of bad actors. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, what it is with the blockchain, it, it think keep the, keep this word in mind, it's trustless. And I didn't really understand that when I first heard about blockchain, but what it is is I don't have to trust you and you don't have to trust me, and yet the transaction can still take place, right? You can be a completely bad actor and I can be a completely bad actor, but as long as we do the things the right way, the transaction takes place. And that's really what blockchains are at their core, um, which allow these trustless transactions to take place. It's, 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 it's amazing. I know people think, well, what, that's, why is that amazing? I have trustless transactions take place all the time. And I'm like, no, you don't. Like every time you p buy something, that's not a trustless transaction. That's Citibank saying it's okay, or your Bank of America, or Visa, or all these third parties get in the middle of that transaction. And For then you mentioned the people who are putting the uh, the false swipe readers onto credit card processors, like at pump, gas pumps, stuff like that. And you're yeah, swiping yeah. your card and they're stealing <laughs> money too, right? That's exactly right. Exactly. So um, DAOs, you, the, like the one thing I've done a lot of research on DAOs and um, I'm a big fan. I think it's still underdeveloped. Uh, it's open source um, and probably one of the biggest negatives to it, which is something that I'm doing a lot of research on right now is uh, with it being open source, that means that, uh, you know, people can get access to the code. And so if there's a glitch or some type of issue um, that leaves a hole open, they can expose it and get into the system somehow and sure. um, very small chance, but potentially get access to the funds that are collected um, for, for, from the DAO. So um, that's something that it's a very early stage. And so it's evolving and getting better. And I think over time, it's going to be uh, a lot more bulletproof, but that's probably like, you know, right now that's kind of the biggest um, hiccup with it. And so I think that's with all smart contracts, this is always um, the risk. The risk is in the code itself, right? Uh, it's yeah. typically not from bad actors who are making the code. It's, it's actually that the code itself has a weakness or a vulnerability. Um, and when I talked, I mean, I know multiple people have done DAOs. 
Um, but there are basically companies who have the code already written, right? Uh, and have been using it for years uh, and have entire teams working on that code. Not to say it still can't be hacked or uh, exposed, but you know, you can basically, I mean, when you're setting up a DAO, you're probably not writing your own code to do that DAO, right? You're just, you're basically borrowing the code or taking the code from a, a company or an individual who's already has built DAOs, right? right. And you're just using their code, right? And that's, yep. just, that's typically what, what happens now. And I know a bunch of people who have literally almost everybody I know in the space is part of DAOs, either investment DAOs, uh, DAOs for, you know, historic NFTs. I know a bunch of people. Who, purposes. Yeah, where, where you basically put money in um, and then that DAO, just think of it as like a corporation, uses that money to buy NFTs as an investment vehicle, right? And uh, it's very simple and they work. And to give you an idea, like I know a lot of you guys have websites on WordPress. Um, similar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, WordPress is an open source platform and got exposed a lot in early, in early stages. And as it got developed and got better, uh, the weaknesses got, you know, less and less, and it just became this massive open source platform where now, like, I think that some stupid, like 60 something percent of the websites in the world are built on WordPress, but it's an open source platform, very similar. A lot of your, I've been building on it since 2003, I think, or four or something like that. <laughs> I mean, it's been around for a while and, yeah, yeah. um, and it's, it's been great. So, um, Anyway, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, all right, so we know what an NFT is. We know how it works a little bit. Um, if, I'm, if I'm new to this, right, uh, I set up my MetaMask. Uh, I ordered my Ledger wallets. Um, where would you go? And, and this could be an opportunity for you to plug, a, plug an OG NFT if you want. Um, but where would you go? Like, give us, give us your most transparent, honest, like, opinion of, like, what would be a good way to get into buying NFTs where it's like, I can get my feet wet. I'm not going to go broke. Mm -hmm. um, but there's an opportunity for something to really happen and eventually turn into something great. Maybe not millions, but maybe tens of thousands. Sure. I mean, for me, I, I deal with historic NFTs, right? I believe that NFTs, people who were building NFTs at the start of this movement in you know, 2014, 15, and 16, um, they were the innovators. And so these are the NFTs that I prefer to purchase. I still purchase modern NFTs and, you know, the newest ape or whatever's um, selling just to sometimes just for fun or sometimes just to support communities or friends that I have. But for me, I, I like to look at historic NFTs simply because the, the scarcity of them is they're truly scarce, meaning there weren't many uh, projects in 2016 and 17 and 2018. There's a hard cap. Right in 2016, there's a hard cap of like five projects in the world that had NFTs. In 2017, there are maybe 20, 25, may, maybe 25 in the world. Right, there are 25 projects launched in the last four hours today. Right, <laughs> so it it puts a hard cap on those the number of those NFTs. So in the same way that you might collect, you know, art from the 15th century there aren't that many pieces around from the 15th century, right? So there's like a built-in supply dynamic that I think is very attractive. Um, plus many of those are, were, are historic from a perspective of they created something new or they did something in a new way. And so those are pretty special. And some of those we've already seen have had massive runs like the CryptoPunks, which you've probably seen on the news and stuff where you can't buy a crypto punk under whatever, I don't even know, $800,000 right now um, or whatever it is uh, because they, they were they, and are really important. Um, and so. And you got I I think MasterCard just bought one or Visa or something. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, um, talk about validation when, when credit card companies are trying to stay relevant and they're buying, you know, millions of dollars worth of NFTs. Yeah. So yeah. I liked, I focus on those and, and you could still get into, many of them for a few hundred dollars. Um, they're still very inexpensive. The reason is, is that not many people know about them still. I mean, look, I did the NFT conference in New York City and I told people, hey, I'm an NFT archeologist. I'd look at, you know, I, I try to find old NFTs. They're like, what's that? I'm like, well, it's NFTs on like Bitcoin. We're and stuff at and an NFT conference. And, and, they're, and they're like, 
and they're like, there were NFTs on Bitcoin. And I'm like, yeah, there were NFTs on Bitcoin. And like, no, still nobody knows. Like your listeners who are hearing this, trust me, like there are maybe 5,000 people in the world who've heard about this. So yeah, it's a new thing. <laughs> it's, it's a new thing looking at old things. So yeah. we're, we're very early, very early. Um, and I say that, look, look, I may be wrong, right? In 10 years, NFTs might not be anything. Nobody uses them. Okay, I was wrong. It's possible, but I don't think I am wrong. And if I am not, if I'm correct, you know, these are going to be worth a thousand times what they are today. Yeah. I, I want to give you guys an example of how I in got introduced into NFTs. Well, I learned about them. I was, I, I, I'm the type of person that probably like, um, uh, does a little bit of research, waits, asks some questions when I bump into people, waits, learns a little bit, and then I'll buy one, right? Um, my first NFT was actually given to me at the Miami conference. Uh, and I think I was with you when yep. the, the guy that launched the conference was like passing out the cards and you got to open it up and see which NFT you got on the, yeah, on yeah. the so that was my very first NFT. Um, and then I came home and I started researching it more and more. And then I found out I, I was a huge card collector, like baseball card collector when I was a kid. Found out Tops was rolling out Tops packs on Wax. Uh, Wax is like a platform where you have a wallet and you can uh, buy NFTs. And so I bought packs of, uh, you know, MLB baseball cards. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a miserable experience. Like, was not good. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, I mean, it's miserable for multiple reasons. One, there was lots of glitches and issues. Uh, two, uh, they, uh, I pressed a button. Like you, you have a billion people trying to buy everything at one time before they run out and uh, it causes glitches. And um, I pressed the button for the premium packs and <laughs> it took me to another page, which didn't have like what I'm buying. It just says like, you know, how many and buy. Right. And so I yeah. bought them and then I, I like spent more than I should. And I, realized, <laughs> I didn't want to say how much. <laughs> yeah. I realized I'm like, I, I like, I, it's like, okay, it's generating the packs and the packs show up and it's bazooka Joe packs. Oh, no. And I'm like, I don't want bazooka Joe packs. Like <laughs> what am I going to do with these? Right. <clears throat> so I got all these, I got, I got anybody interested in bazooka Joe card. <laughs> I've got hundreds of them on sale on uh, wax right now. Um, so, and, and I like, I literally made sure that I was clicking the right, like, anyway, long story short, you got uh VV. Is that how you pronounce it? VV, the app. Yeah. VV. Where they're doing like Disney and all these other types of uh, Marvel. Um, and, and you got kids all over the world that are pressing these buttons so much faster than you at 40 and 50 years old uh, to buy these NFTs. But as soon as they buy them for, you know, 50 bucks, they're turning around and listing them for 500 and getting the money uh, yeah. within seconds of, you know, having it up. Um, and then, so tell us a little bit about like, where should we go to buy? Like, like look, man, people? I would, what you're describing, I would not recommend to the average person. <laughs> uh, because look, there are people uh, out there who are spending 15 hours a day as basically NFT day traders, right? Yeah. They have computers, with like uh, bots built in that like buy stuff before you can ever buy it, right? Yeah. Um, and to try and basically immediately flip it. And dude, I, I would say just don't even get into that game um, unless you're like want to get into that game. But most no, people- I don't think it's for most, for most people, that is not the game you want to be in because that's a, that's a loser game. You're going you're gonna to lose money doing that. Um, and again, it's the type of thing where if, if something's dropping, like you can make, you could, you personally could make you know, a hundred thousand NFTs today, right? So what happens when you, I, and everybody on earth can make an unlimited amount of NFTs, right? They basically become worthless, which yeah. is fine, right? If it's meant to track in real items and stuff, it's great that they're basically free. So, but my view, that's why my view is go for the historical ones because there's built-in scarcity to these yeah. early, early NFTs that can't be replicated now, it's impossible but you can't go back to 2017 or 2016. And so th that's where I, I place my bets uh, on the future of NFTs is just go historical. To learn about that, just follow me on Twitter and we, we dive into it literally every single day, literally every day. This is all I do. It's, it's awesome though. It's awesome because we're actually still finding stuff. We're still, still digging up stuff um, 
on blockchains and different blockchains. There were early, you know, early forks of Bitcoin and stuff like that. Uh, finding these old projects and stuff has been amazing. That's awesome. Well, dude, I really appreciate you coming on and answering all these questions and helping our whole industry understand and uh, view NFTs um, in a way that was digestible. You're probably one of the best people I know that can simplify it. So it's digestible to someone who's never heard it before. So uh, congrats to you for that. And I appreciate that, man. I imagine you're probably responsible for thousands of people getting involved in NFTs. Um, you know, I love your, your excitement and hunger for it. And I'm, I'm excited about the technology too. Um, so I just wanted to uh, bring you on. You knocked it out of the park as I thought you would. And, you know, you're no stranger to podcast yourself. So um, is there uh, any, how can people follow you, uh, your podcast or your Twitter or whatever? How do you want people to connect with you? Sure. The easiest way is just on Twitter. I know a lot of your users probably aren't on Twitter. Um, and that's okay. okay. I'm also on discord, which probably a lot of your, trust me, I wasn't on discord a year ago either. Um, but if you want to learn about NFTs, really Twitter is the home of NFTs. Um, so I'm Adam A. McBride on Twitter, follow me there and you can, you can see links to my discord and stuff, but I tweet every day. My DMS are always open. So you have any questions or whatever people can always, um, shoot me a DM. I'm happy to answer any question. There you go. And then, um, discord, uh, a lot of projects have a discord community and the more active the community, the, um, both on the developer side, uh, and promotional side, and also on the followers, usually the bigger and better the, um, the NFT project is. So, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, listen, we really appreciate you guys following along. Uh, make sure if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, podcast, please do so. Uh, check us out on Facebook, um, Torch Talk Podcast. If you are not there like that, we do a lot of updates and information there. Uh, don't forget, we have rolled out our show, uh, Committed to Culture on YouTube. So make sure you check that out as well and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Such and Such Media. And if you have any questions or anything, don't hesitate to hit us up. I hope you have a wonderful day. Be safe and holla.